Uh, Leslie has only been a member of the church for nine years? Nine or ten? Ten in November. Um, and, and one of the things that Leslie did is invite up uh, an ensemble, which uh, Grace Nicole is leading, and we have Jared Robinson on piano, so thank you all for... And what we need you to know is coming up next week, Reverend Chris Long will be offering a service on, I should have written it down, something, the blueprints of something, something. I knew that without anyone telling me, the blueprints of your life. Um, and then the following week, we're going to talk about the history of, we're going to cast a vision for Unitarian Universalism in Louisiana. We're going to do that on Sunday because we're going to have special guests from all over the state. On Saturday, the 21st, we are inviting in Unitarian Universalists from every congregation in the state of Louisiana that you are also invited to. So in the morning, there will be a discussion of Unitarian Universalist history for all of us uh, in Louisiana. In the afternoon, we're going to split up into congregations, and this congregation will have a conversation about who you were while I was on sabbatical and who you would like to be um, now that I'm back. And so that's a facilitated conversation for us. There's going to be lunch and dinner, and we need volunteers for that. And then in the evening, we're having a talent show that is open to the entire state of Louisiana. Uh, so if you would like to volunteer, Jeff, is the sign-up sheet still out there? So on one of the tables out there, online people, if you would just email me, uh, I can help you sign up. But there's a sign-up sheet out there. We need people who could host, uh, help with food, who could host people in their homes if they're staying overnight, things like that. So you can sign up out there. And it is our annual stewardship drive. I have good news and bad news. Are you all ready? Yeah. Do you want good or bad first? Bad. <laughs> bad news first. <laughs> all right. Seven people have turned in their pledge so far as of when I looked on Tuesday. Um, yeah, you can clap. That's good. That's seven more than nothing. So... Um, you're not supposed to turn it in right away. You're supposed to do your own discernment. Um, so it's okay that we only have seven in. However, here's what's interesting about the seven. They brought in about $40,000. Um, three are from brand new members. Never get excited about the beginning of a pledge drive because uh, it's disproportionate, the, the amount and the number of people who pledge early. Uh, it, in other words, it's not indicative, but it's a good start. And so the theme of this year's pledge drive is we shall be known, and we have two members of the stewardship team. You get to decide who comes up first. Oh, Estefania Navo will come up first, and then Jan Darden. Good morning. Well, my name is Estefania. I've been a member here for 11 years, and I get really nervous, so don't just ignore the nerves, but uh, one of the biggest reasons on why I joined the team for the Stewardship Pledge is one of the same reasons on why I joined this church. Some of the most inspiring people that I know are from here, and Janet and Jane, who invited me to be a part of the team, are some of those. If you know them, you love them. And if you know them, you also know how much they contribute to this church with their time and their acts of service. They are just some of the many members that come here by sharing their time and the labor they have the drive to make this the church that we all deserve. In volunteering with some of you, I've witnessed firsthand all the love, the compassion, the kindness and care that you can't replicate. Thank you. Thank you to every one of you here for your continuous support because it's not just me here, it's 
Every single one of you that I'm looking at, I know has brought so much to this table for it to be who we are here. And I just want to say that you make this church. And I encourage you to make your pledge and keep in mind 2024. Have that in your vision. So make your pledge today in October. Doesn't have to be today, but in October so that we can thrive tomorrow. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm Jan Dardin. Technically, you've all know, as I recently was married in this church by our own Reverend Nathan. He graciously agreed to marry us on the Friday we wanted, just before his last sermon, the Sunday before he left for his sabbatical. I'm not sure most ministers would have done that, knowing he had to prepare that last sermon, but he did, and he made it awesome. And that's just one personal brag I have for this church. So I'm up here because I was also on the budget committee for this year's pledge drive, but I did a little more than put my two cents in, and I'm so grateful to Janet, Jane, Donna, Stephanie, Rick, and Johnny, who created postcards, brochures, posters, and even chose a special song to make our kickoff event a reality. We wanted to focus on and ask you what you love about this church and the reason you are a part of this community. The responses were many and so full of love and so diverse because we are a diverse group of people and we show up for many different reasons. But the most expressed was for our community and the people that make up this church. We got a taste of what it was like to not be able to come here and see each other. But we just had faith that we'd all be back here again. And we are somewhat changed, but still dedicated to our ideals. Nathan has talked about what it was like for the staff while we weren't here, and it took a lot of work to keep it going. But he might not have mentioned this. How many of you sat outside and counted pebbles and wrote notes for the thousands of people that died from COVID? It didn't change anything, but it gave us an opportunity to sit in our closed church space as we sent those messages out into the universe, symbolizing our compassion for our own and for others, much like our peace stones are, where those glass vials of tiny rocks, each one representing a life that ended tragically and unexpectedly were lined up around them. We've mostly forgotten about those rocks, but it's so typical of what this church does but not just symbolically. We regularly show up to fight for the rights of the oppressed, for those that are denied justice, those that are not denied a good education, those that are kept from voting, and those that are denied the rights to their own bodies. We're here because we are free to believe in whatever makes sense to us based on our own life experiences, and because we believe in the principles that are the foundation of this church. So I ask you to think about what you love about this church and what it would be like for you if those doors closed, the big sign turned off, and some other church took its place. That's not going to happen, because we wouldn't let it, but it actually could if it wasn't for the pledges. I was brought up in church, and I just thought the collection plate is what kept the churches going. I suppose it could, and, um, but it would just be a crapshoot. How could we be certain that our ministers wouldn't have to go get a part-time job or that Trey and Lee, our music directors, could stay on without being adequately compensated or that our grounds would remain beautiful, our air conditions cooling during a hot summer, and their office staff would keep up with all the details? These people devote their lives to this work, and in my opinion, they do the work of transforming, of helping us to make this a better place to live and to help us to grow in spirit. I have certainly been transformed time and time again since coming here. What would it be like if your branches group ceased to exist? I'm a member of a branches group of people that have been together for a number of years, and I, we recently were posed a question, do we want to continue in the same group or should we consider disbanding and joining other groups? And I love these people, and I'm thinking, oh, why would we do that? Oh, no, maybe they're trying to get, get away from me, and that's how they're doing it, because I can be kind of annoying. But after some awkward pauses and a couple of us meekly saying, well, we'd rather stay, Bess Corbett boldly proclaimed that they'd have to drag her out kicking and screaming. 
Then we all said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're not going anywhere. So my branches, my choir, being a part of standing for truth and what is right are just some of what I love. I love just being in this sanctuary. So if there's something you love, then you just have to pledge. I personally am going to add another $50 for each pledge that comes in today after this service. But I have to put a cap on it at 1000 That doesn't sound like much to most of you. So that'll be 20 pledges that I will increase my pledge by. And that's scary for me. I'm just living off Social Security. But that's what this church means to me in my life, which wouldn't be the same without it. Thank you. The story of Hagar, Genesis 16, verses 1, 2, 4 through 13, and 15. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not borne him any children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, you can see that the Lord has still not allowed me to have any children. Why don't you sleep with my servant girl? Maybe I could use her as a surrogate and have a child through her. And Abram listened to Sarai and did as she said. So Abram slept with Hagar. It was not long before she conceived. But as soon as she was pregnant with Abram's child, Hagar's attitude changed, and she became haughty towards Sarai. Then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. I allowed my servant girl to be intimate with you, and as soon as she saw she was pregnant with your child, you started, she started behaving arrogantly and disrespectfully toward me. I have done nothing to deserve this. Let the Lord judge who is in the wrong here, you or me. But Abram said to Sarai, look, your maid is entirely in your hands and subject to your authority. Do as you please with her. So Sarai treated her harshly and humiliated her, and Hagar ran away from her. But the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness on the road back to Egypt by way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where did you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Go back to your mistress and submit humbly to her authority. Trust me, I am going to give you many children and many descendants, so many you won't be able to count them. Look, you are pregnant and you are going to have a son. I want you to call him Ishmael because the Lord has heard your anguished cries. Just to warn you though, Ishmael, your son will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he will dwell away from all of his brothers. As a result of this encounter, Hagar decided to give the Lord who had spoken to her a special name because he had seen her in her misery. So she called the Lord Elroy. You are the God who sees over me. In this place, I have seen the one who watches over me. Because of this, the well between Kadesh and Bered is called Bir Alahai Roy, which means the well of the living one who watches over me. Then Hagar gave birth to a son for Abram, and Abram named his son Ishmael. Um, this doesn't affect that much in here, but just so you're aware, we're not streaming, streaming the service, correct, Mike? Oh, well, okay. I just lied to all of you. Online people, welcome. We're sorry it took us longer to, to get on, but we're here now. Um, and I heard from the sound booth it's someone's fault, but that's not true. So um, we have a few names to lift up. We have cards out here. First, yesterday, right when the AC decided to give out, we had a memorial service for Don Patterson, who uh, was not a member of this church, but married into a long-standing Unitarian family. Flowers from his service are in the kitchen. We also have a card for Rebecca Cummings, who was placed in hospice care this week. Um, so we were thinking of her. And if you would place a stone first for the birth and then of a death, Joanna Wilson's granddaughter, Olivia Lucille Martha McAdams, was born. 
and Canova Smith's um, goddaughter, Sierra Ruckman, died unexpectedly this week. This ritual we have is open to everybody, visitor and member alike. We invite those who wish to come forward either along the west or the east wall. Take a stone, let it represent whatever's on your heart. Place it in the chalice bowl. Online people, please type it into the chat. We invite those who wish to come forward as we place stones. And we say together, with hope to make this a better world, we light this flame. Uh, if light is a symbol of the, hang on, hang on. Hey, Jared, uh, let's light the, no, it's okay. Uh, let's light the chalice and then we'll do it, but you gotta do it faster. This church likes a fast doxology. So let's say again, <laughs> with hope to make this a better world, we light this flame. Its light is a symbol of the power of love. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Leslie Grover, and I am a member of the Preacher Pack. <laughs> the Preacher Pack is a group that trained under Nathan to bring sermons to the congregation. Uh, so when we started these classes, we were asked to bring a Bible story or some biblical concept that we struggled with. Now, I grew up missionary Baptist. And as a child, I was super active in my church. My mother played piano for the choir. My father was a deacon, lead deacon, senior deacon, <laughs> and even a Sunday school teacher. I played hymns for Sunday school, attended Nurture for Baptist, sang in the choir, participated in every Bible be there ever was. Summers were the Baptist Association and Vacation Bible School, and then that ended in a revival service where the entire community showed up. Now, if I had been challenged to find a story in the Bible that I had a problem with a few years ago, I probably really needed to give it some thought, you know? Because growing up, I never really thought about the Bible, if that makes sense. The Bible was a guide for God's word for how we should conduct ourselves, but above all, it was a book of love. But also it was a source for the verses we often recited before dinner. 
My favorite was Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Amen. Some of y'all know that. <laughs> now, while the Bible was not taken literally in my church, reading it was a sign of virtue and good upbringing. But I was brought up by loving parents and a loving community uh, that spoke love and power over me, not through Bible verses, but through their actions. Still, I want to say a, a good morning to the members of Newtown Missionary Baptist Church in Charleston, Mississippi, and my parents, Melba and Eugene Taylor, because I know that they are still holding sacred space for me today. Yes. Now, as an adult with my own child, I'm not the same person that I was growing up on the spiritual nectar of my parents' love and prayers in my community. I've had more than a taste of injustice, spiritual quandaries, loss of faith, and some really deep-rooted angry moments with God, if I'm honest. But it's also true that I've experienced wonder, forgiveness, peace, grace, revelation, and love. And so when Nathan asked us to identify a story we struggled with, I looked for love in action. Today is all about Hagar an enslaved pregnant black woman who after being used as an incubator for her captors, ran into the desert to find freedom from the brutality she was experiencing. But even though God sees her and rescues her, he still admonishes her to humble herself and return to her horrible circumstances. Now that story resonates because it's similar to what happens today. That when black women, when we stand up for ourselves, attempts are always made to put us in our places or discredit us. Ask Anita Hill, Stacey Abrams, or even Angel Reese Bayou Barbie Nathan. That's the only time I'm going to say something good about LSU, so. <laughs> but <laughs> where was God's love in sending Hagar back to her suffering? An all-powerful God could have just delivered Hagar from her circumstances completely. He still could have kept her promise, the promise he made to her. But he didn't even speak to her oppressors to soften their hearts before sending her back. He didn't punish them for their inhumane treatment of Hagar or make her life easier once she went back. The God I know and continue to seek is one who is loving forgiving and who does not enjoy when we suffer. He's one who calls us to put action behind the love that we feel through service to others, spiritual self-awareness, and fighting for injustice for those who are oppressed, marginalized, othered. If God loves us, how can he co-sign on our suffering? If God sees injustice in the world and those of us who suffer from it or fight against it, why does it seem like things sometimes get worse? Couldn't he help us just a little bit? Where is the love that God supposedly has for us? So that's the question I get to start the offering ask on. <laughs> All right, um, so with that, we have two different types of offering asks. The first is going to be my fake one, which is going to be an olive branch to our Clemson fan over here, which is, in 2019, I made a bunch of stupid promises to this congregation that if you gave a lot of money, LSU would win, and it worked. Um, I've continued those stupid promises, and it has not worked. In fact, it has not worked so poorly that LSU barely won and Southern even lost last night. And how's Clemson doing right now? Um, that's a spiritual answer. <laughs> For those who couldn't hear, she said, I believe, not as well as they should be. I was just saying they were doing fine. Well, I heard the word fine. Don't worry. What I'm saying, so here is the fake ask. Clearly, we're not giving enough because everyone's team is suffering right now. <laughs> All right, okay, the real ask. <laughs> All right. Um, you all are good sports to go with me. Uh, you're also not allowed to fire me for a year after a sabbatical. <laughs> so um, the real ask, we're going to share half of our offering with Youth City Labs, which is located in a rug store that used to be a church. Right? 
Yes. Um, U City Labs is not just one thing, it's a bunch of things. Um, and they're all, <laughs> I don't even want to pick one of them. Like, you all know what Line for Line is? Um, it's a group of barbers who will cut hair for free for children for every line that they read from a book. Um, I think you all know what Big Buddy is. Humanities Amped has been bringing arts into school for more than a decade, I believe. Um, there's a lot of good works that happen here. So if you're not going to give to help poor Clemson <laughs> not be fine, <laughs> or Southern or LSU or whatever other weird superstitions that I have that I'm letting fully manifest here in this ask, consider giving because half of everything that we offer is going to go to U City Labs for the entire month of October. Five Sunday, five Sunday month? I don't know. But we got to give five Sunday months. You got to give extra so we can look really impressive to them. So with that, I'll invite the ushers to come forward as this offering is gratefully given and received. Before I start this, I just want to say that this is one of my sister Leslie's favorite songs. Um, I've heard her singing this often, and it's great to see the words, and I hope I don't screw it up. Um, but I think it's important that you understand the English translation of these words, which states, there is a well of blood that saves your soul. There is a pool of blood next to the altar. It's got the healing power of life. They say, amen, alleluia. The Trinity in the altar, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The sinners whose lives are doomed, their sins are washed away by the blood. And they live with happiness, and forgiveness. Setting sediba samadhi, Allah warenya te fellow, di basaleng di sitari, madala so na ke bufelo, bayet sediba babasu. Basek neng kaya fulo, badlo hateng kabasweyo, kaswa holy kaswa reylo. Bori a man, huborabu, ta te la mora, oh, in a ma. Maria man Te la te mora Glory, 
Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, on my one hand holding tight and my other. Come celebrate with me that every day Something has tried to kill me and failed.
you understand that today? There is no defeat Where we plant our feet The victory, the victory is ours When my son Ethan was born, things did not go exactly the way I thought they would. My pregnancy was beautiful and easy, but when it was time to give birth, the natural birth that my husband at the time, Kendall and I planned, was not to be. Instead of going through what I thought was a quote unquote normal birth, free of drugs with minimal intervention, I had to be induced. And after nearly 24 hours, I still wasn't going into labor and had only dilated about two centimeters. My doctor came in and told me that they were gonna have to take the baby because the stress of laboring had gone on long enough. My heart dropped. This wasn't supposed to happen. I'd done everything right. I'd eaten the right foods. I'd stayed hydrated. I'd taken my vitamins. I'd done my breathing exercises. I even listened to classical music and read aloud to Ethan before he was born. This wasn't right. During the experience, I felt at odds with my body. I had a hard time relaxing before it was time for me to, to have the procedure. What if my baby knew that his birthing process wasn't natural? What if my child didn't recognize me or trust me? What if the hormones or pheromones or whatever other biological processes didn't work either? What if my baby hurt, hated me? What if I was hurting him? What if the doctor hurt him during the procedure? How could I be a good mother if my body couldn't even give birth correctly? But Ethan Grover was born healthy and alert. Examining him, I noticed that he had Kendall's eyes, my mother's nose, my peanut head, <laughs> my long arms, spindly fingers, wide feet, and toes that could open and close like hands, just like mine. I smiled as I held Ethan in my arms for those few moments before they took him away to check him thoroughly. I still couldn't believe that such a beautiful, perfect boy was mine. <laughs> I was still a little out of it from the anesthesia, but I do remember that Ethan didn't cry when they took him from me. And I felt like that was confirmation of his disconnection from me because my body hadn't been able to bring him into the world naturally, as beautiful as he was. I was exhausted and I was devastated. Later, I woke feeling a little bit, a little bit better. I was alone in the hospital room because Kendall um, had gone to d check on some things for the house and prepare for my parents coming. Um, and then a nurse came in the room. Now, I expected her to bring me my Ethan, but she arrived with paperwork for me instead. Without making eye contact, she thrust some papers in my face. She told me that I needed to complete all the blanks on the page, that it was against the law to do so, and I would go to jail if I refused. She told me if I didn't know my child's father, I still had to put something there because I couldn't leave that space blank. It didn't matter whose name it was and whether or not I knew the father, I still had to put some name there. Then she left the room. I angrily completed the paperwork, being sure to write Kendall's name in big capital letters, going back over the lines to make them extra bold, just like that nurse's tone with me. The woman didn't even know me. She barely acknowledged me, so why, should, why did she assume that I didn't know who my child's father was? 
she saw a black woman in a room alone and made assumptions based on that. But I still focused on the moment to come. So I sat there, breathing deeply, ready for me to have my, my Ethan. The next nurse that came still didn't have my baby. This time there was another woman with her, and this woman took my completed paperwork and introduced herself as a social worker. She told me that if I wanted to give up my baby, I had 30 days after I left the hospital to do so. If I decided to abandon my baby, sell him, or give him away any time after that, that I would be arrested. She said I could bring my baby back to the hospital or leave him at the fire station within and only within a 30-day span. Then those two women left the room. Another nurse came in to talk to me about breastfeeding. You aren't expressing any milk right now, she told me after examining my breast. Don't you know that breast milk is best for your baby and that without it, the baby's immune system might be at risk? She scolded me on and on and on, telling me that my baby could die from sudden infant death syndrome, that he could have diabetes, and, and that he had a higher chance of dying within the first few hours of his life without my breast milk. She told me that it was my responsibility to breastfeed and that the earliest moments of my Ethan's life were supposed to be filled with nutritious breast milk and failure to do so would put him at risk for poor brain development. Then she tossed a brochure at me and left the room, but not before she reminded me again that I should still be expressing milk at this point. I felt alone and cold. <laughs> Why am I getting emotional? Not only had I not been blessed with a natural drug-free birth, but now I was a willful, incompetent, neglected, underperforming mother who refused to breastfeed her child. I sat with my eyes closed, and I was feeling sorry for myself, but I was feeling even sorry for Ethan. Because I thought I had ruined his life before he was a few hours old. Y'all know I don't cry in public. It's allergies. <laughs> Finally, a nurse walked in with Ethan. You have a handsome, healthy baby, she said. Just look at that little face. What is his name? She put Ethan in my arms, but I didn't answer her because I was waiting for her to start in on what I was doing wrong. <laughs> or the bad news that something was wrong with him and, you know, he wasn't going to ever grow up from being an infant or something, I didn't know. But she didn't say anything, and, uh, and I didn't say anything. But all the anger and confusion and emotions that I don't even have a name for came rushing out. I wept and I moaned and I wailed and I was just holding Ethan to my chest and I was shaking and crying and rocking and all the tears that I had refused to fall in my anger, they just forced their way out. But unlike the other nurses, this nurse did not leave the room. She didn't raise her voice and she didn't turn up her nose. But I still pulled back from her when she tried to put her arm around me when I rocked Ethan. So sitting on the side of the bed and not touching either of us, she just started rocking with us. And she said, I work with sick infants and I can always look at a baby and tell how they're gonna turn out. I've been able to do this for years. This one is a good one. He's got a wonderful life ahead of him. I just looked at Ethan and held him and I was admiring his handsome face and I was just glad he was safe. And once the nurse saw that I was okay, she nodded and smiled at Ethan and took my temperature. But there was still something bothering me. I said, I don't have breast milk for my baby. Is he gonna be all right? Can I do something? I, I don't want him to die, I don't want him to dehydrate. And can you please check in for diabetes or is it too early? And <laughs> she said, those are lots of good questions. Give me a moment. And then she left the room. But now I didn't know what that meant when she left the room. Because I was feeling like I failed Ethan. But when I looked down at him, I noticed he was looking up at me. And first he squinted like he was focusing his eyes, the mole on my chin. He seemed to frown at it at first, but then his eyes lit up and he smiled at me with such love, such love. The nurse returned, 
Such love. I love you, favorite. The nurse returned with a bottle of baby formula. Not everyone has breast milk in the beginning, but your baby isn't going to die. He's healthy and you are too. Your body did what it was supposed to do. Give him this formula until your milk comes in. It's okay. Around that time, Kendall came in and she congratulated us and handed me some tissues and the formula bottle. A change, oh, a change has come over me. He changed my life, and now I'm free. He washed away all my sins and he made me whole. <laughs> he washed me white. Until he comes A wonderful change Has come over me A wonderful change Has come over The story of Hagar is one that has scholars arguing. Traditionalists treat her as nothing more than a footnote. She was an enslaved person uh, that was a footnote in the story to Abram and Sarai, who were later Abraham and Sarah, um, and she just helped in the building of a nation. Other scholars 
have questioned Hagar's true status as an enslaved person in an effort to whitewash her story, to downplay her circumstances, um, and to decenter her in the biblical context even further, focusing the story more when we talk about God's promises on Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. But regardless of whether or not Hagar was an enslaved person or a servant, it still doesn't address why she was sent back to the cruelty of Abram and Sarai by a God who could have easily saved her. God could have sent her back to Egypt and kept his promise to her son Ishmael and make him a father of nations. That still could have happened. Some scholars point out that Hagar, this black woman under this system of enslavement, is the only woman in the Old Testament who is heir to a promise identical to that of the patriarchs and other men of the Bible as though this makes her suffering worth it. Now, it is significant that Hagar is the only Old Testament woman who has ever had a recorded theophany, and that is an appearance from God, and is a recipient of the promise of possession of land and a large number of descendants. Some scholars have even pointed out that God making the same promise to Hagar as he did to Abram is a form of love. But is it really? Okay, yeah, so they both served as foundations for nations and they both suffered in their own ways, but there's a problem with this viewpoint. This viewpoint centers Abram as though Hagar being treated in a fashion similar to him is more acceptable uh, because she was enslaved. More than that, it gives an impression that equality is a form of love. And equality is not a form of love. Yeah. Equality centers men with power as though they are the standard that those of us who, not, who are not need to meet. It centers the dominant culture as though being closer to it or assimilating to it is the same thing as love. Equality minimizes Hagar's existence because equality suggests that unless you are like those who hold power, you are less than or unworthy, that how you are is not enough. Where is the love in that? I knew that to understand Hagar's relationship with God, I was looking in the wrong places. So I thought back to something my big mama used to say. She used to say that you can build a world with what you don't know. Yeah. Now what she meant was that not knowing was a starting point and not a permanent state of being. And that learning, starting with questioning what we do know, is a good place to start to build. So, wouldn't a loving God want us to honor ourselves as part of his creation? Equality is about making ourselves like those around us, but liberation is honoring ourselves and our own experiences just the way that God made us. Yeah. What I do know is that a loving God sees the beauty and power in all of his creation, and that all of us existing the way he made us, rather than assimilating to one arbitrary or biological social standard, is love. Yep, we would describe Hagar as a black woman today, but back then, black didn't have the same political and social implications as it does today. Hagar's servitude wasn't necessarily under the same chattel slavery that Europeans used to justify violence and cruelty toward the Africans they forced to build the, you know, their wealth and foundation and social status. So to truly understand where the love is in this story and centering Hagar, we start with Hagar. What did I know about how she honored herself and her experiences as part of God's creation? What did I know about how she experienced liberation, that is to say love, in a moment where she was sent back to an unloving and abusive situation? Hagar was Egyptian, and as a result, she appears to have leaned into her culture when she met God. Genesis 16:13 tells us that as a result of this encounter, Hagar decided to give the Lord who had spoken to her a special name because he had seen her in her misery. So she called the Lord Elroy. Yeah. You are the God who sees me. Hagar, unlike any other character in the Bible, named God. 
And this is significant because the ancient Egyptians believed that names were essential to a person's identity and survival. They believed that names represented life, beauty, and connection with the divine. The ancient Egyptians believed that the world was created by pronouncing the names of everything that came into existence. They believed that names were an essential element of beings, just as necessary for survival as life force or the soul. So Hagar, in naming God Elroy, leaned into her own divinity and the love she had for her culture. The name she called God and also the place where he came to her lets us know that the biggest part of love in this situation began with Hagar's agency in walking in her own form of liberation. Good morning. Good morning. All right, y'all. So when Leslie knew she had this service, she said, Shemake, I want you to be a part of it. <laughs> All right. And then Nicole said, come sing. I was like, okay, but I didn't want to sing. As y'all can see, I'm hoarse. But I'm a poet. Yeah, I'm out. So when Leslie sent me this, <laughs> sent me the scripture, the verse, I said, oh, Lord, help us. I said, okay, I'm going to write something, but I'm going to uify it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so I have been a member of the U for one year, so bear with me. Here, loving is celebration, mourning. Our love is joyful, even when we hurt each other. Because we know none of us are perfect, and none of us are trying to be. But passion, come on, URBCC. We can do, woo! Come on, UCBR. You know we can use a little bit more of that. True or false? True. And the thing is, we be people full of passion. Hmm. That runs through fingers as they press on keys and through a lover's hair. Passion is the flame that lights the chalice. Passion is fingers dressed in divinity running across keys, hair, skin, leaving behind infernos of life in its wake. Passion is ocean water crashing on beach shores where I pretend that I don't mind the sand just so my toes can get wet with its primordial force. See, passion comes over us strongly, Come on. stays with us with intensity, barely controllable, emotive. Perhaps, beloved, we'll see the changes we desire to be when we decide to release control and stop being afraid because the price of self-control is slavery. Mm. Freedom finds us in the wilderness when we are brave enough to go. Yeah. To the flame, leave behind your worries and come out changed, ready to be loved passionately. Please be passionate with me until so we are all free. Ashe and blessed be. Wow. Let's go ahead and sing this next hymn. I invite you to rise in body or spirit.
Though Hagar was an enslaved woman in an unfamiliar country and living with those who mistreated and objectified her physically and spiritually, she still was not a passive slate for God to command and control. She was an actor in her own fate. From the time she, de she decided to leave her abusive circumstances to the time she held her own with God, right down to the time that she decided to go back to Abram and Sarai, Hagar chose to believe God, even though she knew she was returning to cruel and uncomfortable circumstances. Yet with love in her heart, she saw a liberated future for her and her son where the goal would not be equality or assimilation, but rather hard-earned power to be exactly who God created them to be. Perhaps Hagar understood that where there's agency and liberation, there's also love. When I got home from the hospital with my perfect Ethan, my parents were waiting. I told my mother a little bit about what happened, and she said, yes, the pain of childbirth no matter how you feel, hurts at the time, but you forget to dwell on it because any child that comes into this world is a blessing from God and evidence of love. Yeah. And she was right. I mean, look at Ethan. Uh, he's love and joy in the form of a boy, and he was love in the midst of a situation where I was mistreated. Since Ethan's birth, I've used my birthing experience to help other communities create liberated spaces from small black rural places like the ones I grew up, all the way to Cuba where black maternal health is improving because black women there seek community and care in homes rather than in hospitals that can actually be more dangerous for them. And last year, I birthed my first book that centers black motherhood. I am descended from Hagar, those whom the horrors of enslavement, sexual violence, and systemic inequities could not kill. Like Hagar, I have a son that the world falsely paints as dark, wild, and dangerous, unequal, unworthy. But like Hagar, I must do my part. We must do our parts to build the liberated future our descendants deserve, even though we may suffer today. Like Hagar, my power, our power, is rooted in love. Like Ishmael, my son was born with the birthright to exist in his own way and with the ability to build nations even though others may fight against him. My son deserves to be safe from police brutality, medical racism, and the self-hatred that can come when marginalized people turn their harm from systems that discount them in on themselves. Mother Hagar's story reminds us of a truth that we can build a world with. The supernatural we sometimes expect could never be more powerful than the love inherent in the liberation we deserve. All right, let's go ahead and sing our closing hymn. I invite you to rise, body or spirit. She is not heavy. I'm gonna lift my sister up. She is not heavy. I'm gonna lift my sister up. She is not heavy. If I don't lift her up, if I don't lift her up, I'll sing this like y'all know it. If I don't lift her up, because you do. I will fall down. I'm gonna lift our children up. They are not heavy. I'm gonna lift our children up. They are not heavy. I'm gonna lift our children up. They are not heavy. If I don't lift them up. If I don't lift them up, if I don't lift them up, 
I will fall down. I'm gonna lift my brother up, he is not heavy. I'm gonna lift my brother up, he is not heavy. I'm gonna lift my brother up, he is not We are not perfect, but we are perfectly fitted for this day. We are the ones we have been waiting for. May we be bold and courageous to chart that new future. May we have faith in a future that is not known. We are the ones we have been waiting for. Amen. Ashe, may it be so. I'm gonna lift my sister up, she is not heavy. I'm gonna lift my sister up, she is not heavy. 